Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm, we're joined by Dr. Charles Foster. He is a fellow of Green Templeton College, a member of the Oxford Law Faculty, a senior research associate at the Uhiro Institute for Practical Ethics, and a research associate at the Ethox Center and the Helix Center, both within the Faculty of Medicine. He's the author of many books, and today we're going to talk about his most recent one being a human adventures in 40,000 years of consciousness. So, Dr. Foster, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Great to be here, Ricardo. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's perhaps start with the subtitle of your book. Why do you say that it is 40,000 years of consciousness? I mean, why start there? Well, let's pick up the story about 200,000 years ago. So 200,000 years ago in the fossil record, we see beings who anatomically are more or less identical to us. They might have slightly larger brains, but they're more or less us, but they don't behave like us. Um, for about 150,000 or so years, um, they're uh, very different. Um, and then about 50,000, 40,000 years ago, they suddenly start to look behaviorally like us. Um, they start using extravagant symbolism. They start being obviously religious in a way that we would um, understand. We emerge then. So modern consciousness um, happened about 50,000 or 40,000 years ago. And that's why I start this journey, which is an inquiry into the sorts of creatures we are then. Okay, so then before that, we already were conscious, but perhaps not with the kind of consciousness you want to explore in the book. Well, my conviction in relation to many species and uh, my suspicion in relation to very many more species um, is that uh, lots of things apart from humans are conscious. Uh, but the particular type of consciousness, the particular manifestation of consciousness, uh, which we regard as quintessentially human, um, is something that we see from around 40,000, 50,000 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So back then in the upper Paleolithic, how did people live? And I mean, what were the aspects of how they lived back then that played an important role in their consciousness? They were hunter-gatherers. Uh, they uh, were intimately, necessarily um, connected to the natural world. They had a sense of dependency on the natural world. Um, they saw the boundary between themselves and the natural world as a porous one. Um, I think it follows from that that they defined um, themselves um, in relational terms, and many of those defining relationships were with non-humans as well as with humans. Um, they were technologically very sophisticated, so they had uh, very sophisticated stone tools. They were adept at the use and transport and focused use of fire, and they were very religious. They had um, a sense of uh, the existence of other worlds apart from this one, and um, their relationship with those other worlds was crucially important to their understanding of, of who they were and how they should act. Mm -hmm. But compared to early periods in the, in the evolutionary history of humans, I mean, what kinds of practices were developed back in the Upper Paleolithic that dis didn't exist before? So, if you go to a decent museum, um, and walk through the human evolution galleries, they're frankly pretty boring until you come to the Upper Paleolithic. Until you come to the Upper Paleolithic, you see rather dowdy artifacts, very functional, and then suddenly you turn the corner and there's the Upper Paleolithic and you see symbolism, a great explosion of it. And the uh, debate continues as to how sudden this explosion was, but the fact of the explosion and the tectonic nature of the explosion is not in doubt. We see, <coughs> we see 
things like stone and bone, for instance, being made to stand for things other than stone and bone. So a piece of stone might be worked into the shape of a wolf. A piece of bone might be uh, worked into the form of a caribou. And that opened up um, a, a great world of possibilities. If a stone could be an elk while still remaining a stone, um, what wasn't possible. Um, so I, I talk in the book about this being a prismatic age. Um, when you shine white light through a prism, um, the light splits and is shown to be uh, full of entirely unsuspected colour. Um, the Upper Paleolithic was an age in which it was discovered that the world was full of uh, complexity and uh, possibility um, that had never previously been um, suspected. And uh, one of those possibilities was the possibility that biological life wasn't the whole story. Um, hence the massive uh, concentration that you see in um, Upper Paleolithic symbolism on uh, survival after death and on the expression of, of the agency, not just of humans, not just of the creatures whom uh, humans hunted, uh, but also of the dead, both uh, the human dead and the animal dead. The impression seems to be that they believe that agency increased after death. Mm -hmm. But was the development of these new social practices accompanied by the evolution of new cognitive abilities? And when I say evolution, I'm not implying necessarily biological or genetic evolution. It could have been cultural evolution, but was that the case? Yeah. So there's every reason to suppose that one of the elements of this uh, great symbolic outburst was um, the representation of the world by more sophisticated language than um, had previously happened. Um, there was, um, in other words, um, a great burgeoning of abstraction. Um, and that was probably, um, Robin Dunbar and um, many others have written about this, that was probably um, due to a need to um, increase social cohesion. So Robin Dunbar has has illustrated very beautifully that um, in primates there's um, a neat straight line correlation uh, between uh, brain size and particularly uh, frontal lobe size and the size of the group in which those primates are found. If you uh, extrapolate that line to humans, um, we would expect in humans um, group sizes of about 150. Um, but it's quite strenuous to keep up um, the necessary attention um, to um, 150 uh, that's required to maintain it. In primates, that uh, group cohesion um, is maintained by grooming, physical grooming, which uh, stimulates uh, afferent fibres and produces a pleasurable outpouring of, uh, of opiates. Um, but you can't um, spend enough time uh, to groom and therefore cultivate and maintain relationships with 150. So other things have to come in in order to make up the shortfall. One of those things was certainly language. One of those things was laughter. Uh, one of those things uh, was music and dancing. Um, and those drivers to social cohesion, um, it, it is plausibly thought, uh, both drove and were driven by um, the, the 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 culture which evolved. Mm -hmm. And how do you look at the role religion played back then? I mean, since it was sort of a newish phenomenon, let's say in human societies, what was its importance socially, and perhaps I mean, to what extent do you think it might have contributed to? 
uh, da uh, development of new conscious experiences, because, for example, religious people talk a lot about having uh, all experiences and stuff like that. So what do you think about it? Yeah. So it's difficult um, when one's talking about the origins of religion to um, to disentangle cause and effect. Perhaps the best place to start in relation to Upper Paleolithic religion is by looking at Upper Paleolithic art. Um, and often those glorious masterpieces of Upper Paleolithic art and very early Upper Paleolithic art, the, uh, the, the cave paintings of uh, southwestern Europe, for example, are in extremely inaccessible places. You've got to crawl a long way through very narrow cracks in the rock, um, carrying presumably a light um, made out of uh, a reed stuck in oil from an aurochs kidneys. Um, and the, the paintings themselves are um, very odd. They're done by people who have an unparalleled mastery of artistic techniques, have a superb grasp of the anatomy of the things that they're depicting. But um, often some things are missing. So you might have um, a caribou with its right leg missing. Um, you have these animals orientated on non-naturalistic planes in relation to one another. They seem to flute rather than to stand or run on a, a plausible plane. Um, often, too, you have uh, therianthropes, so animal-human hybrids. And uh, an, an orthodoxy about the meaning of these things is, is gradually evolving. Um, and insofar as we can talk about uh, a consensus, it's probably something along these lines, that these uh, cave paintings um, represent uh, animals into which shamans um, are uh, converting. So a, a shaman uh, is depicted with the head of a wolf uh, because he or she is in the process of, uh, of turning to or from a wolf in order to go as a spirit animal into the world beyond the cave wall. Um, the uh, caribou miss, is missing its hindquarter because the missing hindquarter is across the veil of the cave wall in the other world. So th there was uh, a shuttling of the shamans, at least, between this world and the next. They went into the other world, it is thought, in order to bring back wisdom, blessings, which could um, benefit the clan. And it may be that those journeys were uh, facilitated uh, by the um, inducing of altered states of consciousness by strenuous activity or the ingestion of uh, psychedelic substances or so on. And, so on. Um, and it is thought too generally that um, the dead, both the animal dead and the human dead, uh, were to be found over the other side of uh, the cave wall. So you have generally a, a sense of um, realities other than this one, which are in a constant and defining conversation uh, with this world, um, and a sense, as I've already indicated, that uh, agency increases once uh, biological death occurs, rather than, as we uh, suppose to be the case now, generally uh, diminishes. So religion was defining. If you have a sense of this, this laminated universe with many realities other than this quotidian one, um, your whole sense of self is very different. Uh, and that's going to be particularly the case if you think that yourself, whatever it is, and however you express it in the, uh, the, the pronouns of the language which you use, is going to um, not only continue, but be enhanced after your death. Mm -hmm. So you touch there on the connection between religion and, and art, but apart from the points where they connected, 
Was art uh, also an important development back in this period and did it also contribute to uh, some sort of expansion of consciousness? Uh, I, it, again, it's difficult to disentangle uh, the causal threads here and say what was caused by um, X um, rather than causing it. Um, no doubt it was a manifestation of the symbolic revolution, which was the great uh, tectonic um, cognitive shift in that time. So uh, the paintings on the wall were made to stand for uh, things other than the paints on the wall. So a, a painting is not um, a, an auroch. Um, but the fact that um, these things were thought to have Celtic significance um, indicates that um, they thought that these symbols which were generated in their heads and then reproduced on the wall uh, were capable of mediating in, uh, in a, a powerful way with the other entities in the, the world which they supposed there were. So yes, um, art no doubt played an important role almost priestly function um, in the in the cognitive and uh, particularly the religious life of the Upper Paleolithic. Mm -hmm. so, so we will get into the Neolithic and the agricultural societies and also the situation we are today after the advent of the Enlightenment, but talking about the sense of self do you think that back then in the Upper Paleolithic people had a different sense of self than we have nowadays, for example? Well, they certainly had a sense of self. Um, that screams out from all those symbolizing objects that you see on the shelves of the museum. They all scream out, I, 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 me, me, me. And if you scream out, I, 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 and me, 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 you're also acknowledging the existence of another of the other uh, to whom the I um, can relate. Um, I don't think that sense of self is unique to humans. Um, I certainly don't think it was unique to these upper Paleolithic humans. Um, I, I think that sense of self um, in some form is present in, in lots of non-human species, but certainly it uh, expressed itself in a particularly exuberant way in the early upper Paleolithic. Um, and I think it's uh, immediate and most lasting uh, bequest was the generation of stories. So if you have a really highly developed sense of I, the I has to do something. You have to make sense of it. Act, actors um, <sighs> maniacally act. And so uh, I'm certain that um, stories which made sense of their perception of the meaning of the I and um, all the other um, religious um, perceptions that there were, uh, were spawned um, particularly in this period. Um, the sense of I was a relational one, as we've said. The, uh, the I was defined in terms of its relationships, not only with other humans, but uh, with the, with the the non-human world. So if you ask an Upper Paleolithic human um, who they were, they would give you an answer, as I think decent human beings now um, give you an answer, in terms of the nexus of relationships um, of which they were a part, which included relationships with grass and trees and caribou. If you ask them to define where they were in the universe, they would say, that they, their place had to be defined by a series of triangulations from the other entities which were important to them. And since everything was important to them, um, there was an infinite series of triangulations um, necessary in order to define their place. Um, another way of putting that insight is its ecology. <laughs> um, so an acknowledgement of the intimate um, entanglement of things and the absurdity of, of talking about ourselves in the atomistic terms, which um, have come to be common for us modern humans. 
Mm -hmm. So, with the advent of the Neolithic and people settling down in sedentary societies based on agriculture, I mean, what were some of the most dramatic changes in terms of how people live their lives that had the most impact in the topic you're exploring in the book, namely consciousness? Yeah. Well, for a couple of preliminary observations about that. Um, it's become customary to talk about the Neolithic revolution as if it was a sudden thing and as if it was a, perceived as a desirable thing by everybody. Um, it wasn't sudden. It happened um, over a very long period and sites like Gebekli Tepe in eastern Turkey um, confound the old uh, presumption that uh, hunter-gatherers were basic people with um, no political sense, no ability to organize. You have their great monumental structures, which were um, evidently constructed by hunter-gatherers. Um, there's also plenty of evidence, uh, both from modern hunter-gatherer societies and from the ancient past, um, that the, the shift to the Neolithic and to sedentism and to farming um, was undertaken reluctantly. Um, in, in many ways, sedentism uh, confers lots of disadvantages, um, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. But for that reason, it, it didn't happen as a, a glorious uh, eureka moment of, of acknowledgement that uh, farming sedentism was a glorious new way to be and that uh, hunter-gatherer life um, was uh, uh, an atavistic, uh, shabby way of existence. So probably um, the, the earliest signs of, of true farming um, occurred in the Near East. Um, although having said that, um, the uh, the evidence from Africa is increasingly um, overwhelming the Eurocentric uh, foci of, of archaeology and no doubt a lot more happened a lot earlier in Africa uh, than, than we think. But anyway, when it happened, um, it conferred lots of detriments. Yes, um, there was uh, when the harvests worked, when the rains came, when the sun wasn't too hot, um, there was f uh, food um, on tap next door to you in the fields rather than you having to go and, and get it from a long way away. Um, but it also produced status in a way which hadn't previously existed, probably to the same extent. Um, because if you have a surplus, you have hierarchies. You have those who have and you have those who don't have. It produced division between men and women. Uh, because if you have um, men who are going out in the fields and harvesting and women who are staying at home grinding corn, it's possible for the men to represent themselves as the primary producers, which isn't so easy if both men and women are involved in the hunter-gatherer project. Because you have population increases um, as a result of all the corn you can eat and the reproduction that that can engender. You have um, epidemic disease for the first time. You have occupational diseases for the first time. You have arthritic conditions. You have rotten teeth um, to an extent you hadn't seen before. Um, and all of these, all of these pressures um, produced uh, violence, stress, neurosis in a way which hadn't um, previously been seen in um, hunter-gatherer cultures. Um, it's natural enough if your harvest fails on your side of the valley, what more natural than to pick up your spear and go to the other side of the valley uh, where the harvest hasn't failed and take the corn from your neighbours. So um, although Stephen Pinker would disagree with me, uh, I think the, the general thought is that um, 
human human violence um, is plain in the archaeological record from the Neolithic onwards, and that there are only isolated and rather equivocal examples of it before that. So um, I'm rude in the book about uh, the Neolithic revolution and its consequences. Uh, we drew lines across the land then, walls and fences, in order to contain uh, the animals uh, that we had tamed. We drew lines between uh, ourselves and other species, uh, which caused us to see ourselves as better um, than those other species, which ultimately resulted in the ecological catastrophes which uh, we're now grappling with. And we drew lines across our own minds. We created compartments and our minds weren't as holistically uh, functioning as they had been previously. So, sorry, Ricardo, a very long answer to your very straightforward question. Uh, no, no problem at all. And since you mentioned that considering all the advantages and disadvantages of moving, moving from uh, hunter-gatherer to agricultural societies, would you say then that the Neolithic was a net negative? Uh, I, I'm afraid I would. Um, we can see in it the seeds of lots of our present personal, psychological um, and political ills. Um, I've mentioned some of those already. Status, uh, hierarchy, uh, control of the non-human world by humans, control of uh, human X by human Y, the subjugation of women, um, uh, as well as the, the uh, biological detriments like uh, diseases of, of, of sedentism and diseases of, of, of overpopulation. But perhaps the most toxic of the, uh, the things which the Neolithic produced um, was a consequence of the notion of the straight line. I've said something about those straight lines already. Straight lines across mines, straight lines across fields. Um, but the only straight lines that you see in Upper Paleolithic cultures are the straight lines of erect penises um, in Upper Paleolithic art, which are typically uh, shamans um, in a, a state of ecstasy, and the grid lines on um, the walls of uh, Upper Paleolithic caves, which uh, may indicate the entoptic phenomena associated with altered states of consciousness. After the Neolithic, straight lines are everywhere, and the most sinister straight line is the straight line which indicates progress. So it is assumed from the Neolithic onwards um, that not only should humans be getting bigger and better, in inverted commas, um, but there is evidence that they are doing so. Um, and so progress itself becomes uh, an object of almost religious veneration. Um, human achievement is seen not in terms of objective human thriving, not in terms of being happier or kinder or uh, more nuanced, but in terms of being bigger, better increasing your surpluses, increasing uh, the difference between your society and the next. And by the acquisition of mere facts, as opposed to um, the growth of wisdom. And it may be that we come to this when we start talking about the Enlightenment, um, but uh, central to the, the Enlightenment project was that notion of progress, which um, one can credibly link to lots of our uh, political and ecological crises. Uh, so why is it that in the book you call the Neolithic the age of domestication? Uh, because uh, as a matter of archaeological fact, it was the time when uh, we um, locked up for our own use um, in fields and paddocks next to us, creatures 
and plants which had previously been wild. Uh, but also, and more importantly, it became the time of our own domestication because we were the ones who were ultimately um, imprisoned most significantly by the walls and the fences. Um, and we can see, see one of the uh, consequences of domestication, both of ourselves and of uh, domestic animals, um, in brain function. So domestic animals have smaller brains uh, than their wild counterparts. And particularly, um, they have s uh, smaller um, excitation systems, small, uh, a, a less uh, active limbic system. Um, domestic animals are literally less alive than their wild counterparts. Um, and you see this extraordinarily even in domesticated fish. And I think you see it too, in domesticated humans. Um, we are not as alive as our hunter-gatherer forebears were. But was there anything positive in how our conscious experience changed uh, during the Neolithic, or do you think it was mostly negative? Well, I, I struggle to see that there was a a net benefit of any sort. Um, it's commonly said that the Neolithic um, and farming produced um, leisure for reflection and that one couldn't have had the, the great philosophical discoveries of, uh, of later ages um, without um, having your meat and your corn on tap. I think that's nonsense. The, uh, the evidence suggests that hunter-gatherers have a good deal more leisure than farmers. Uh, when, uh, when farming uh, is introduced, um, hunter-gatherers are normally only converted to it at the end of a whip or under uh, severe economic duress. But nonetheless, it is true that if you're a member of an elite in uh, a, a farming culture, um, you can live parasitically of the people who do the real graft in the fields, and then you might have more time to sit and write your poems and cogitate on the meaning of the universe. So in that very limited sense, um, the Neolithic revolution might have enabled a uh, a, a few real uh, advances which might not otherwise have happened, but I think it came at a great cost. And the, 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 the costs um, were costs which we are really experiencing now in a very dangerous way. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the Enlightenment, why do you single out the Enlightenment as a distinct period in our evolutionary history? I, I mean, in this case, in telling the history of human consciousness. I'm not sure if you would call it a period or an event, or an event if you think we're still living in the Enlightenment or if we're now in the post-Enlightenment or something like that. So what do you think about it? Well, I singled it out because this is a book about the pivotal moments in human consciousness when it seems to me that there was a, a shift in the nature of consciousness. So uh, if I were writing a history of human consciousness, I would have focused particularly um, on uh, the, the three periods which I have focused on, but also on that great period between about the... Uh, 8th and 5th centuries BC, perhaps, um, when there were the birth of the of lots of the great religions of the world, um, where there were lots of cognitive discoveries, uh, particularly um, in Greece and in China um, and the Near East. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to me that that great golden age was um, a time when there was a really seismic shift in in, in the nature of, of consciousness. What was happening then was that 
um, existing forms of consciousness uh, were being incrementally um, evolved. Um, more iterations on the sorts of things that one could do with the consciousness that one already had uh, were being developed. So I wanted to write a book uh, which talked about massive tectonic changes. And it seems to me that there are three, Upper Paleolithic, Neolithic, and the Enlightenment. But why the Enlightenment? Um, there, are, there are several reasons, but um, the, the most important reason is that up until the Enlightenment, the world had been seen as an organism. In the Enlightenment, it was reconceived as a machine. Um, the roots of this go back to Descartes and the, the scientific revolution, his distinction between uh, the mental mind and matter. And that sounded like a benign move, but it eventually led to the conclusion that there was only matter. And so what had previously been seen as, as a, a throbbing, morally significant, ensouled thing, the world, um, filled by throbbing, significant, ensouled um, organisms, uh, was reconceived as a machine filled with little machines. Um, and that's very significant. If you reconceive the world as a machine, it's not obviously morally significant to smash it up. If you think that a caribou has a soul, um, then it's morally significant to kill it and eat it. And that generates uh, a deference towards the natural world, um, which we could do with a good deal of. Um, take away its soul and you take away its significance and you take away the obvious reasons for behaving towards it uh, with respect. And uh, up until the Enlightenment, um, the, the view of the ensouled universe had been absolutely mainstream, e even, in the, even in the church. Um, so the, the medieval church had adopted um, Aristotle's view of, of the hierarchical nature of the biological world. There was a vegetable soul, there was an animal soul, there was uh, a human soul. Um, yes, there was something toxic about that because it allowed us to denigrate uh, non-humans, but still there was the sense that these were morally um, significant creatures. Come the enlightenment and that all goes. And um, uh, eventually one of the casualties too was human significance, um, which led, I think, to uh, lots of our own neuroses, lots of our own feeling of, of loneliness um, in the universe, and um, lots of the, the atomism as opposed to the relational conception of the self, which so uh, bedevils our economics um, and uh, forms so much of the time spent on psychiatrist couches. Um, I mean, that said, of course, there were lots of wonderful things about the Enlightenment. Um, it was an exhilarating time of scepticism. Uh, its insistence that there were no questions uh, that could not be asked was fantastic. Um, it did free human minds from uh, lots of genuinely debilitating superstitions, but uh, it took away uh, the sustaining stories which uh, we need in order to thrive as humans. Mm -hmm. So why do you think that our relation to what you call in the book the more than human world is so important? And I mean, by more than human, do you mean our relation to the rest of, for example, the biological world? Or do you also include some religious aspect? I include religious aspects, I include um, the biological world, I include the physical world. Um, you know, as you know, there are many mainstream philosophers these days, uh, from Whitehead onwards, Whitehead, Strauss and Nagel spring to mind, who um, insist that the best, most parsimonious solution to uh, the otherwise intractable problem of, of how you get consciousness from unconscious matter is to um, suppose that uh, 
all things have consciousness in some form. So if you have consciousness in an electron and have consciousness in a badger, um, we live in a universe in which the possibility of relationship is, is endless. And it takes us back to almost where we started. Um, if we are to make sense of the sorts of creatures that we are, we have to do that uh, because this is a relational universe uh, by describing the nexus of relationships uh, in which we exist. We have to, we have to have that, um, that perspective on ourselves, which uh, says it's nonsense to talk about an, an atomistic Charles Foster. But this, this, after all, is the basic Darwinian insight, isn't it? Um, you know, the, the, the cousinhood of, of all biological organisms. Um, it's the basic ecological insight, which talks about uh, the, the interdependence of, of all um, living and non-organic things. So the, the reason that uh, reason I bang on about this is because um, these political and philosophical speculations flow inevitably from any accurate description of the way the universe is actually woven together. So uh, since we're talking about the Enlightenment, what do you think about Steven Pinker's view of it? Well, um, Stephen Pinker has uh, put himself forward and is regarded by many as one of the high priests of the Enlightenment. And he is an immensely clever and articulate and engaging exponent of science. Um, my worry about not only Stephen Pinker, but about the way that modern science uh, generally has gone is that it is... Uh, wholly at odds with the true original spirit of the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment said, be sceptical about everything. Um, and I see Pinker um, and uh, his modern allies as representing not science, but scientism. So science for them has uh, transmuted from a method of inquiry into a set of axioms which one has to believe in order to be a member of an intellectually reputable uh, community. The most obvious of those axioms um, is the axiom that there is nothing but matter. Um, perhaps I can illustrate this by a, a qu quote which I shall make inaccurately because I don't have the text in front of me from Stephen Pinker but he says something like one of the great um, bequests of the scientific revolution is to uh, put to end forever um, the intuition uh, that the universe is saturated with purpose. Now, it may be the case that the universe is purposeless, um, but one certainly cannot demonstrate that in um, a scientific way. You can't look down a microscope um, and uh, demonstrate the purposelessness of the universe. You can't show it by uh, an intricate um, series of equations. Um, the fact that observations like that are uh, accepted uncritically as um, a statement of this scientific uh, project makes me very worried about the future of science and its ability uh, to um, contribute meaningfully to the discourse which we urgently need about the sorts of creatures that we are and about how we should live. Okay, and what would you say then we should tell people about the kinds of creatures we, we are that perhaps would help with some of the problems, existential ones particularly, we're going through now? We are quintessentially relational beings. It makes no sense, scientifically, psychologically, politically or otherwise, to talk about ourselves as atomistic entities. The defining relationships that we have uh, are and must be relationships with the non-human world as well as the human world. 
and we need storers, um, sustaining storers which are worthy of us. The only prominent story um, in the current marketplace is the demeaning story of the free market, which uh, sees human beings as significant only because of their ability to contribute to the economy. Now, we need stories to make more sense of the sorts of creatures that biology and archaeology have demonstrated that we are and what we perceive ourselves to be. And those are old stories. Um, and in this book, I travel back into the deep past in order to try to retrieve some of those stories so that I can begin to live by them and so can be a slightly less unsatisfactory husband, father, friend. Yeah. So uh, let me just end with this question then, and perhaps I will ask you the same as I asked you about the, the Neolithic. Do you think that the Enlightenment is a net negative or a net positive? And I mean, I, I also wanted to ask you if when referring to the Enlightenment, uh, you're talking about the original enlightenment because when i asked you about stephen pinker's view of it you made a sort of contra a contrast between uh, his view and other contemporary thinkers views uh, of it and the original enlightenment thinkers views or or, or I, I mean what exactly do you mean by that yeah well uh, apart from the the reconception of the universe as a machine and the desolment of the universe, my main problem with the Enlightenment is that it is not uh, doing what the original Enlightenment thinkers um, insisted. It's become anti-skeptical. It's become essentially religious. So Stephen Pinker is a fundamentalist religious man, um, and uh, he insists on uh, his followers um, reciting the catechism of material reductionism. Um, so, if we could recover the original sceptical um, spirit of the Enlightenment, um, that would be, it seems to me, a wholly good thing. Um, and it would recover the romance of science, the excitement which scientists should feel um, in order um, to, to do their work properly. They should go um, into the lab in the morning with a sense of what on earth am I going to discover today rather than going into the lab as most of them do to uh, to confirm the items of the reductionist catechism to squeeze into the received materialist pigeonholes uh, the facts that they observe now if science were doing what the Enlightenment hoped that it would, it would discover, I'm certain, uh, that the world is far more wonderful than the materialist uh, reductionists insist that it is. It would look um, excitedly rather than fearfully at the outliers which um, in uh, the history of science have taught us far more about um, the real nature of the world than looking at the things which are in the center of the bell curve. But I see a, a really uh, tragic, depressing fear amongst um, many mainstream biologists, particularly. I exclude quantum physicists from, from this criticism. Um, so let's please have the proper enlightenment back. Let's uh, use the the proper enlightenment values to liberate science um, and to uh, let it explore fearlessly um, the, the nature of the universe rather than uh, fearfully trying to confirm its own rather sclerosed creed. Right. Okay, so uh, the book is again Being a Human, Adventures in 40,000 Years of Consciousness. Uh, would you like to tell people before we go where they can find your work on the internet? Um, well, there's a website, um, www.charlesfoster.co.uk, and there's a list of publications on that website if people want to follow things up. 
Okay, great. So, Dr. Foster, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for, so much for taking the time to come on the show. I've enjoyed our conversation very much, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. Please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it, it keeps running. I will leave links for Patreon and PayPal in the description box. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunde, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bird Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, then Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassi, Arthur Kozup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Sandman Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormer, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andre, F. Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weida, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desaraujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Pliz, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Back, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, my producers, Isar Webb, James Frank, Lucas Stefaniak, Ian Gilligan, Liz Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos Friends and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, and Sergio Codriani. Thank you for all.